Um, today we have two folks here from Public Council. Millie Kakani and Mara Ziegler are going to speak to us about um, helping our clients who have been impacted by trauma and how to uh, represent them as effectively as possible um, and at the very least avoid re-traumatizing them. Um, be sure if you're going to ask any questions uh, to take one of the microphones that are on the table. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, as Matt said, my name is Millie Kakani. Uh, I have been at public council now for a year with the Transition Age Youth Project, supporting young folks aging out of probation and foster care, many of whom I imagine ultimately become your clients. Um, and prior to my time at public council, I was in your shoes, but in the Bronx. So much respect to the work that you all are doing and defending the fundamental right to parent. Good afternoon, my name is Mara, and I've been at public council just 30 years. Um, I'm a social worker in the Children's Rights Project and work under Millie on the Transition Age Youth Team and focus on the same population, and I have sort of a specialty focus on young parents in care, um, <clears throat> pregnant and parenting youth. Um, so I know there's a lot of crossover with your team, and we hope to change that. Um, and as long as they are your clients, um, give you some tools so that all of you can work well together. And the purpose, again, of our training is to provide you with some real strategies to ask questions of clients in ways that respect their trauma, because I think we can all accept that everyone sitting in the, whatever, second through fifth floors of that building down the road um, are victims of trauma, parents, children, grandparents, caregivers, um, and <laughs> try to create a space where you all feel more comfortable answer, or create a space where um, they feel more comfortable answering your questions and leave both you and your client intact after your interview. And just a caveat about being, if you all are triggered, feel free to take a break. Yeah, so um, I'm also an adjunct professor at the USC Suzanne DeVort Peck School of Social Work and I do a lot of um, teaching about trauma-informed practice and um, it's very clear and documented that a lot of us who go into the work are trying to repair our own stuff. So I see it in students, I see it in professionals, and um, really please take care of yourselves if you need a break. Just step on out, ignore us, whatever you need to do. And so having said that, um, by show of hands, how many of you in here have been to at least a trauma 1A training before? Okay, just a few of you. For those of you who've been, um, I do want to say that I do this training about a dozen times a year. I attend trainings myself, and I still learn every time. So I hope that will be the case for you. And um, because there's such a large number of you who've ever done it, we're going to go really basic. Um, so um, anybody, whether you've been to a training or not, want to take a stab at sort of the short version definition of what trauma is? Anybody? You're talking to your friend, the engineer, who really is trying to get some understanding of what you all do here every day. And you're like, it's all about trauma. And that means, thank you. Uh, maybe the ongoing effect of a serious incident. OK. You got the first bit. Maybe you can repeat that as well. The, oh, I'm supposed to repeat it for the remote folks. Hi. Um, one of your colleagues said it's ongoing effects from, from an incident. I'm going to actually, for the sake of time, give you the cheat sheet. Next slide. Um, if, if you remember the three E's, it'll be really easy for you to give the elevator speech explaining what trauma is. Um, as you said very wisely, it starts with an event or series of events. The next E is probably the most important piece to remember is about how it's experienced by the person um, that you're working with. It's a very personal, subjective reaction. Um, but typically, a trauma event or series of events are events that spell threat, harm, danger for an individual. And, and, and their usual coping mechanisms become very much overwhelmed. They feel physically, emotionally, otherwise in danger or harm. And so it of course, if that's how you feel, it's going to have effects on your functioning in lots of different domains, which we'll talk about later. 
So now you have a quick, easy way to explain to your friends who are in totally different <coughs> lines of work. Who? How many of you have friends that kind of give you the pat or say, wow, I can't believe what you do? I see a lot of bouncing heads. And you're like, well, it has a lot to do with the three E's. Now you have an easy way to explain it. And um, a, a key takeaway is to understand how subjective it is. What feels like trauma to me might not feel like trauma to you. What feels like trauma to me today, based on how much sleep I got, what's going on in my life, the supports I have, and a lot of other factors, may not even be experienced as trauma to me tomorrow. So the subjective nature is, is the key, and it's not always even the trauma event, but the response to the event. Does that make sense, our folks with this? Okay. So just a little bit more about what I just said. Um, Typically, trauma is not only an event or series of events, it's, it's usually unexpected. And because it was unexpected, um, the person is usually not equipped with the skills that would help them manage the trauma in a way that would help them be a little bit more resilient um, and respond effectively. And um, this third one is, again, human nature. Whether the perception that you can do anything to prevent it is real or imagined, it's how it's experienced by a trauma survivor. So they believe there's this helplessness. They believe they have, there's nothing they can do about it. Um, and so you have this result of vulnerability, helplessness, feeling like you have no control over your life, over the world. and. Um, that often leads to that famous fight or flight response. Um, there's the spectrum of types of trauma, and um, acute is, um, let me give you the definitions, just a sec. Okay, acute is not adorable, it always, I hate that that's the name. Um, it's the single time limited incident. So can you think of an example? that maybe isn't abuse or neglect, that could be experienced as trauma that's a one-time event? Car accident. There you go. Car accident. Hurricanes. I mean, all the stuff that's happening now with floods, hurricanes, etc. Um, a, a war. Um, you know, d just a one-time event in your village, your neighborhood, you know, whatever. Um, chronic is just like what it sounds like. It's repeated. It's ongoing over an extended period of time. What you all probably see a lot of is complex trauma. And it's, it's really a very cool t cruel type of trauma because it's often um, chronic within the caregiving system. <coughs> so it's folks that experience ongoing, usually abuse or neglect, from the very environment that's supposed to be protective and talk about not being able to escape or control. Um, it's, it, has, it has a lot of um, bad effects when it's this interpersonal type of trauma. And then the insidious and historical, um, again, I'm sure you see this all the time, it's, um, it's historical racism from the beginning of our country to what we see today, um, a discrimination based on any of the isms. Um, you know, um, race, gender, immigration status, all of those things. And if it goes on, whatever kind it is, um, or is severe, it can lead to what we talk, what, what the mental health people call PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, where the person becomes just preoccupied with the trauma, it affects sleep, the flashbacks, I'm sure most of you seen it in the movies, let alone if not in your clients. Um, so what I'm going to do now is nerd out a little bit on the brain science because that's the key to today's training is understanding that on a neurobiological level, trauma impacts everything about us. And neurobiology simply means um, the science of um, the impact of life events on the human nervous system. So um, let's move to my next slide. That way, right? Whoa. Did I just turn it off? There you go. Okay, so this is my one cool slide. I don't have tech skills, but watch what's going to happen. Okay, so what is the neurobiological impact of trauma? Let's talk about that. Um, 
These are scans, brain scans, from the Children's Hospital of Michigan. And I really dislike that phrase normal because what in the world is a normal person or a normal brain? But it's being contrasted to the brain of someone who's experienced a lot of neglect in this instance. And um, let's, let's look at different parts of the brain. So this part of our brain is the prefrontal cortex. It's the last part of the brain to develop, and it gives us the higher level brain skills, um, which are, anyone know what those are? They're called executive functions. Anyone ever heard of those? So want to yell out what one or two of them are? I'm just trying to keep you awake during lunch. I know it's, anybody? It's a professor. I mean, so. Logic. There you go. OK. so. Understanding logical consequences, planning, judgment, all those things that help us function well in life come from this last part of the brain to develop. And what we know is that in folks who experience early trauma, in this case neglect, do you notice the difference here? So much less developed the prefrontal cortex than here. So that's one important thing to understand. The other thing, I'll try not to turn it off. Isn't that cool? Um, Oh, it didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's in white. It's there. Oh. The amygdala is what that says. It is the teeniest little brain structure that is known as the fear center in the brain. <coughs> and what do you notice in contrast in these two slides? Highly developed. Yes. Right. And you were going to add anything? Or yeah. So. We know that in folks who are exposed to this stress and this trauma, their fear center is on fire, like literally and figuratively, right? So um, stress and, and our amygdala keeps all of us alive. You gave the example of a car accident. If some you know, idiot cuts you off when you leave here and your amygdala fires on and goes, you know, flight, run, um, and you swerve and avoid an accident, that's a good survival skill. But what happens to people who are exposed to a lot of stress, multiple stressors and or chronic stress, is the amygdala never calms down. If you think of it as a light switch, it's stuck kind of in the on position. And um, when that happens, you know that stress hormone we've all heard about, cortisol? It just flows consistently. Rather than the, cort the shot of cortisol, which then releases the adrenaline hormone, so you quickly drive like the best you've ever driven, avoid the damage, and then in, in a, a person who's not you know, really traumatized, that all kind of calms down and goes away. But we know in folks that are trauma survivors, it kind of is stuck there. Um, what else do I want to tell you? This is just an interesting thing. This little brain structure connects the right brain, left brain, you know, the logic, creative, memory, all that stuff. Notice in this brain. So even the brain structure that helps us put together emotional experiences and logic is not as developed in folks who've experienced trauma. And if you're a little bit of a brain science nerd like me, I'll tell you the name is called the corpus callosum. And um, so trauma is what I'm telling you is it's a state of arousal that, that, that impairs integration across a lot of domains. Learning, memory. So this is where it's really applicable to your work. You'll have hopefully this light bulb and go, aha. Um, with people with brains built like this, um, the central nervous system doesn't synth help me. Synthesize, synthesize, thank you, memories in an effective way. The little brain structure where memories are usually uh, <coughs> synthesized and stored is called the hippocampus. And um, it's not working eff effectively when the brain is having this danger, danger, danger thing going on. Um, what happens is the individual um, who's been traumatized, their brain develops focused on survival, often at the expense of these more advanced skills that we mentioned earlier from the pre prefrontal cortex. So they literally, um, with this biological urge to survive, which is human nature, um, lack access to memories. Um, and what else do I want to say before I get off the science nerding out? Um, 
So if you think of the hippocampus as sort of the filing cabinet for memories, um, and understand that when your brain is screaming danger, danger, memories stop being stored in the filing cabinet. Okay? The cortisol is going numb out. Act, fight, flight, or freeze, but forget this, you know, effective brain function and memory storage, you need to survive. So can you imagine when you're sitting there with a client, we'll talk about in a few slides, going, and then what? Or remember to do this. You, you are frustrating yourself and the client if you don't understand they might need some work on their trauma experience before either of you can work effectively together. So the moral to this science nerdy stuff is <coughs> experience alters the way our brain's wired and the way our brain is wired affects how we respond to the world. So please don't take it personally um, when your clients um, are rude to you, don't want to talk with you, they need parenting and anger management and substance abuse treatment. You're, you have somehow found the best resources for them in the world and they don't follow through. This is a brain on trauma. Are you next? I think so. So what does this mean for you all as lawyers who are on the front lines? And on here it says you may be witnessing trauma responses, but I think we can um, rest assured that you are witnessing trauma responses. And again, they're not chosen by your client, right? This is just the way they are surviving. I just remember getting ACS, in New York we called them ACS, um, but getting kind of DCFS reports that either said the client had a flat affect or they could not control their emotions. So it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, but there was never this real understanding that that was simply a survival mechanism for many of our clients. Um, so again, the anger, the flat emotions, being on edge, being anxious, calling a hundred times or not calling at all. I mean, those are all, the, the range is, you know, zero to a hundred, basically. Um, and again, so under pressure, you may see that a response um, does not really seem to match with your client's personality. So you may have kind of broken through, established something with your client where they trust you and you have a relationship and they confide in you and then in court it's, you know, they can't, I don't know, they can't act the way you want them to act. I just feel like there's this expectation from judges and from even just opposing counsel that our clients are supposed to sit there and listen to all of this stuff that's being said about them without having the right to respond, without having the right to engage, speak up for themselves and it's like, God, just sit there because they're going to judge you for everything that comes out of your mouth and everything that you do and the way you look. Um, but it's, it's simply something that cannot be helped because of the trauma that they've experienced. Um, and again, this doesn't mean that your client is not listening or does not want to listen or isn't talking to you or doesn't want to talk. It's, it's simply survival. Um, um, and again, I think this is so important. You know, sometimes it felt like when I was interacting with clients, it was just kind of like they weren't interested in what I was saying. And in my mind, kind of losing your child is like worse than anything that I could ever imagine. And I'm like, how are you so numb to that? But it's not disinterest. It's literally just shutting down to survive. Um, and it, it's oftentimes being distracted by shock, anxiety, feeling of help, feelings of helplessness, flashbacks. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that and engage your client in that conversation so they know that you're on their side. Um, just a couple weeks ago, we were in court with a client who, her attorney had just received a report from DCFS, of course the morning of, so much for giving anyone a heads up. Um, and it said something about how her uncle had said that she was drunk all the time and falling over into the bathtub and she was just like, she could not, it was really hard for her to focus on kind of what the, the end game was, was being in court and kind of coming up with the plan and solving this. And in that moment, all she could do was call her client, and, not call her client, call her uncle and say like, how could you do this? How could you say this? Like calling everyone in her family and trying to tell her you have three minutes before we get into court. Like we have got to stay focused and we have to remember what the end game is. But I think, again, because of that trauma and because of that fear and that feeling of helplessness, all you want to do is call everyone in your circle and kind of express your rage to them. Um, I just want to interject. We have a whole separate training we do on, um, on handling trauma, vicarious trauma, you know, helping yourselves and the clients, and I recommend you get one of those later. But I don't know if you've heard of grounding. I use that with clients in that situation, and it's calling, um, it's a mindfulness technique where you call the senses into, into action to help bring us out of that 
fight or flight sympathetic nervous system back into the parasympathetic, okay, I'm, I'm managing here. And so you can use sight, smell, sound. I've had a client call me from the bus stop more than one just freaking out because something like that has happened. And I'll literally say to them, all right, talk to me. What do you see? Where are you? I'm at the bus stop. What do you see? Well, I don't know. I'm standing at the bench. Is there a stoplight? Yeah, there's a stoplight. What color is the stoplight now? Green. Okay, what other colors do you see? Well, there's a patch of pink flowers here. I'm telling you, it's like magic. It doesn't solve their problem, but um, when we're in fight or flight, that part of our nervous system that's focused on survival, a sympathetic nervous system is all activated. So you may want to play with that in a way that you're comfortable. If you use sounds, you use sights. I see if, I don't know, maybe people have tried something like that. Yeah, you can do it with yourself too. If you're anxious or you feel like, you know, you're nervous, I, I always just say, just, what colors is this and that? And I just, you can use yeah. touch. If yeah. you're, thank you for adding that. Mm -hmm. If you're feeling anxious because you're about to meet with that client that always triggers you, um, think about, like right now I'm leaning, I would literally go, okay, what do I feel? I feel a hard table. Where are my feet? Okay, how does that soft? You can do it. You can use touch here. Thank you for saying that. And one other trick, and then I'll let Millie talk again. Um, one training I went to, um, the presenter reminded us how many, not everybody, but a lot of us, we hold tension so tightly in the pelvis and hip. And he gave a tip that for me resonated and I use frequently. Um, either I'm surprised a meeting turns crazy. Or um, I know I'm going in with a client that's very easily triggered. And he just says, tell yourself, soft front, strong back. I mean, even now, I just relax my pelvis a little bit. And it literally helps you leave less tense when you're done with this client. And it helps you be more effective with your client. So maybe try and be focused on, am I all tensed up? Strong back, like I'm here. I chose this work. I can do this. But I'm going to soften for me and the client. So thank you for sharing that. Um, how does this impact your ability to do your work successfully? Oh, sorry. Um, so there are a bunch of, as Mara had mentioned, neuro neurobiological impacts of trauma across many domains of functioning. And so here are some very kind of specific ideas of what trauma reactions can look like. Um, I'm not going to read or go through all of them, but take a look. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about trauma and memory. So I talked about how we can't always access the memory filing cabinet or the files in them because our clients cannot. Neuroscience, not because they're being difficult or because they're being deceptive. It, it's really kind of a, a stress management bit of knowledge for all of us. It, it reduces our frustration. And it's not an excuse, but it sometimes is an explanation. Um, so. It not only means they may not have the memory, they may have shades of the memory, and then the chronology changes. You ever have that? Every time you talk to them, the chronology is different. Um, it may be linked to sensory information. In a minute, we're going to talk more of that. I have an example on another slide. Um, maybe they do remember, but they feel guilty. Um, I have this with a lot of clients who are survivors of sexual abuse. They're very confused about their body's automatic response and yet their terror at the experience. And so out of guilt and shame of that confusion, they don't want to talk about it. Um, and then of course, you all know more than me, um, if they were using drugs or forced to take drugs, um, that does all kinds of other crazy things to memory. Um, so. What we're asking is that you recognize and respond to memory impairment by kind of expecting contradictions, um, except that memory is processed differently in folks who've lived through trauma. Um, but gently, non-judgmentally, address inconsistencies with your client. Hey, you know, last time we met, you told me, you know, X, Y, Z, and now you're saying this. Let's talk about it again. Let's see if we can, you know, what, what do you think is, is the actual fact? And um, listen, determine if you might need expert assistance. Might be above our heads sometimes. Um, again, I don't know your resources, but if, if, if you're working with someone who just can't access that, it's not your skill set, it's something to consider. So like Millie said, for the sake of time, we squished a lot of stuff into slides that we're not going to read to you. 
but this is for you to have for later. There, um, we break it down into about, I think, six domains, seven if you count memory that we've already talked about, of human functioning. Um, these are symptoms you may see in trauma survivors. I neglected to give my most important um, caveat at the very beginning, which is um, trauma is not destiny. You'll see in a slide or two, it can be addressed, it can be dealt with, you can work effectively with your clients. So these are things you may see. We don't assume we're going to see any or even all of these, okay, or all these or even any. But just to give you an example, um, sensitivity to sound, smells, touch, or light. I'm sure a lot of us hear a song sometimes that transports us right back for good or not good to an experience we had, right? I was working with a client once, a teen parent, no one had explained to her there's resources and rights regarding um, her ability to get childcare to help her go back to school. Her child was six months old. She had finally said, okay, I'll do this. A lot of foster youth are so ter more terrified than your average parent of putting their child in um, a stranger-based childcare, right? Because look what happened to them. Um, often at the hands of people in their own universe they trust, let alone a stranger. And so she finally got to the place where she's like, yeah, I want to get on with my life. I want to go back to school. She had started to look at some places, and we're having follow-up meeting. Meeting's going well. Um, all of a sudden, I see this glaze. Anybody see that with a client in the middle? Like, she just tunes out, and her leg's bouncing. Well, I addressed it. Because guess what? If I hadn't addressed it, the rest of the meeting would have been a total waste of both of our time. What ended up happening is she heard an ambulance go by. She, because I addressed it, she told me the second child care provider that she heard had an opening when she got there. I don't think I've ever told you this story. It's going to traumatize Millie. She's got little kids. Um, she sees um, the paramedics taking a toddler out on a stretcher who'd had some kind of allergic reaction or maybe a um, seizure. And it just freaked her out. You see, these places aren't safe. So there I am going, we can do this. We're going to work on your goals. Here's what you need to do. Here's, here's all this stuff to help you do it. And she just shut down. Her cortisol was flowing. And because I stopped my agenda, which is hard for us to do, right? You all have, I don't know how many hundreds of cases. You need your information. You need to move on to the next. But guess what? By taking three minutes, maybe it was five, to, to say something just changed in you. You want to talk about what's going on? She told me the story. I was able to validate how scary that must have been. And then guess what? We went back to talking about her next steps. So that's just one concrete example of how some of this stuff is very real and very usable. Um, and Millie asked me to talk about one more client who um, so far we've successfully kept from being your client. She, she is 21, she's aged out, um, she's needing a lot of support, two little ones. And, um, gee, are you surprised to hear there's a lot of conflict with the children's parent, other parent? Are you surprised to hear that? Um, and so, because she has such difficulty with affect regulation, managing stress and emotions, she does like the zero to 180, she's very aware of it. This kid is so resilient, she has so much going on. But um, one time I was visiting with her at her housing place and helping her do some things. I even drove her to help get some documents. And I'm dropping her off, and the door is um, a code, and the code is broken. And the kids are screaming in the car. It was one of those, like, 100-degree days. And she just starts going off at the housing people, which probably isn't a good idea when that's your last possible place to live. And so I explained to her... Um, a little bit of psychoeducation, we call it in my field, what was going on with her. Um, not at that exact moment, because no one's in a hearing, listening place when they're triggered. But we got the boys in the house, she was having something to drink. And I borrowed Dan Siegel's hand model. Anybody ever heard of him? Google it. He's a great YouTube. So he's a great child trauma expert. And he uses this with children, and I use it with adult clients, too. And I, I encourage you to use it with clients in, in a calm moment. So he says, this is your fist is like how the brain develops. The primitive part first. This is the brain stem. It's the basic stuff that keeps us alive, like respiration and stuff like that. And then as the brain grows, more and more parts develop all the way till that prefrontal cortex, which helps us manage 
much better than, than these slides indicate. And this thumb is like the amygdala, the little fear center. And he explains to clients, when this thing is going off, you might flip your lid. And so the trick is to learn how to keep this thing from going too crazy, from staying, <coughs> you know, activated. And so I explain this all to her, and I'm like, so we can work together to try and help you. You know, I just said like this, keep this calm. The next time I went to see her, she says, Mara, Mara, that thing works. I said, what thing? She said, I was so mad at him. He told me he was coming to get the kids, and then he was two hours late, and I was about to lose it. But I took out my hand, and I did this thing. And you know what? I didn't scream at him. So whatever <laughs> works, right? I'm just trying to give you some tools and tell you this stuff is real, but we can help our clients, even when we're not clinicians. These are things, I mean, you're using the grounding on yourself. You can certainly use it with the client. All right, looks like it's still me. How many of you have heard of this term, ACEs? Wow, I'm so glad we're here. Um, so it stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Maybe you've heard of that. And it's fascinating. Um, I won't go into a ton of detail for time, but it's really important you know this because I guarantee you it's impacting your parents that you're working with. Um, in, um, in the mid-90s, um, coincidentally, Kaiser down in San Diego and the CDC on the other coast, doctors at each place were studying the same thing. They were looking at actually pretty middle class, pretty you know, white individuals, um, so pretty homogenous, not tremendously under-resourced group, adults who had health issues and weight issues. And they're like, I'm curious, is there some similarity in their background? And what they learned blew their minds and became so important that today we have a, a pediatrician by the name of Nadine Barcaris. I suggest you Google her TED Talk. She's very entertaining and she's brilliant. She has been appointed the first ever Surgeon General of California. We've never had a Surgeon General before because ACEs have that much importance. They have to do with um, basically three types of categories of adversity in your childhood, right? Um, abuse, neglect, household challenges, the list keeps expanding. Um, uh, the mother was treated violently and the children witnessed it. One or both parents used substance abuse. Parental mental illness, um, parental incarceration, parental divorce. Um, racism, community violence. Do any of you think any of your clients perhaps might have had an ACE in their life? Maybe one? Well, the stats are staggering because um, by age 18, 45%, so nearly half of children in this country have had at least one ACE. Um, looking at the population as a whole, um, nearly a quarter have experienced three or more ACEs. <coughs> And, bless you, and there's this correlation between the number of ACEs and how you are doing later in life. Relationships, behavior, thinking, and what's really scary is heart disease, cancer, suicide, alcoholism, and even early death. This is what we've learned from ACEs. And um, if you have four ACEs or more, some of just the really freaky statistics are you're six times more likely than someone with less ACEs to attempt suicide or complete, seven times more likely to become an alcoholic. So again, not to excuse a parent you're representing who's struggling with these behavioral or substance abuse issues, but this is what's going on. And their brain has been focused on survival mode and, and, and not on this. So that I always try and balance all the doom and gloom with some optimism. I wear rose-colored glasses. Nadine Barcaris um, has been charged with <coughs> California passed a law that in it's either 2020 or 2021, Medi-Cal providers are going to be required to do ACEs screenings at pediatric visits. And obviously, if you have an early screening, you explain it to a caregiver, parent, or foster, or auntie, guardian, whatever. They can address it early. And the earlier you address it, and they understand, again, even this child is not being a bad child. They're trying to survive. It's the trauma. So um, I encourage you to look into that. And remember, ACEs are not destiny. They, 
they can be healed. And this is probably the most uplifting slide of all. And I then I, I yeah, yeah. Why are they just doing it with um, Medicare? I mean, sorry. Why are they just doing it with Well, Medicare? I think the hope is, did, did the other people hear her question? Or did she? Um, okay, so why are they just screening the Medi-Cal recipients and not wealthy? Um, okay, so I can be quiet for a minute. Anyone guess an answer to that? They're more likely to experience. <laughs> well, that's probably real, but mid look at the, the sample was middle class, you know, pretty non-discriminated against. But from what I understand, it has to do with um, rights. Um, you know, Medi-Cal providers, they want the money from the government. They got to play by the government's rules. To force a private practitioner to do that, I don't think we have that power yet. But I believe Dr. Harris's hope is this is going to show, this is going to change our state. And that private practitioners will want to do it and will be a model for the country. I think they already do it at Kaiser. Do. Kaiser does it. Well, because Kaiser started all of this. Um, so anyway, we don't have more time. There are whole trainings on ACEs. YouTube it. Um, I think it'll really help you in your practice. And then the uplifting slide is, how can you help? More good news on these advanced brain scans. We now know, contrary to the old school thought where we thought 21, brain's done, what you got is what you got, we know the brain can continue to grow and develop for the rest of our lives. The older I get, the happier I am about this concept of brain plasticity. And um, quick guess, um, what does the research show is the number one tool to help people literally build new neural connections, rewire their brain, help the prefrontal cortex fill out a little bit? Any guesses? Exercise. The way you think? All, all important. Can you repeat it? Okay. People are guessing what tools or, or things one can do that is most important to repairing the brain, helping the brain grow and develop and overcome this, you know, survival brain to a more higher functioning brain. One more guess. Okay, all of those count, but here's the thing. It's you. It's relationship. Positive connection with other humans, especially humans that are advocating for them. So you are helping to rebuild brains. Every time you're patient with your, your clients, Every time you start going, oh, I get it. This is why you're making me so frustrated out of my mind. You don't really know how to be different. And you stay non-judgmental and you stay cool and calm and you work with them and you, you address it with them. You are literally rebuilding brains. And um, so this can happen for our clients. This can happen for us. A oh, little bit more and then you get in the way again. So um, <coughs> trauma-informed practice, the cliché. What is it? Believe it or not, um, the government website, Substance SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, has a ton of this. So this is real stuff now. This is real science. It's bought into by our policymakers at all levels. Um, it's a framework that is responsive to everything we've talked about so far today. It says trauma is real, and it has an impact. And we need to avoid um, re-traumatizing trauma survivors. We need to give them any sense of power and control we can have. And maybe the most important, for you to all keep doing the work you're doing, not only does a trauma survivor need to feel safe, you, the provider, needs to feel safe. Um, so we need to consider all of this. And so how? They call it the four R's. Realize, recognize, respond, and resist, okay? Um, so it's, it's a strengths-based movement, and um, I want to see something on my last slide. I just want to mention um, there's a new paradigm being floated out there called healing-centered engagement um, because trauma-informed practice, they say the trauma-informed practice question is not, what's the matter with you, but what happened to you? And healing-centered engagement is taking the strengths-based glasses another level, another notch up, and saying, what's right with you? So one presenter once said, you can find something right with your client, even if it's, hey, there's no dirt under their fingernails. Find something to build on. Because, come on, we're all human. Don't we feel better if someone tells us we're doing something right? So, um, so be strengths-based. 
realize the impact that we've talked about today, recognize the symptoms that we've talked about today, um, respond, make adjustments to how you conduct yourself and your meetings and even how you prepare them for court um, based on supporting resilience and avoiding re-traumatizing um, by really working on avoiding triggers. So I know that, you know, this is a little dreamy because how do you have time with 300 clients to learn what their particular triggers are, but to the, event, the best of your ability, get a sense of that. It will make your life easier and make their cases go better. Trainings like this are an important first step. And Millie mentioned earlier, there's no such thing as a perfect trauma survivor. They're going to have bad facts. They may treat you in ways that don't feel so good. Um, but just try and stay ahead of it as, good, as well as you can. Wait, was I doing the next one? I, knew I, hadn't. I think you're after that. Okay, I'm really going to stop talking now. Nope, two more. Um, so, <laughs> I thought we divided it up more. So, um, these are, if you look on the SAMHSA website, the, the key trauma-informed practice principles. Remember safety for your client, but for you too. So, literally things like um, where you're sitting in the room. Maybe ask them. Remember empowerment is on there and choice. There's a seat facing the door, a seat with the back to the door. Let them decide where they want to sit as long as you feel safe doing that. Um, where do you meet? How do you meet? Um, trustworthiness. If you say you're going to call, call. If you say you're going to meet, do your best to show up on time. Um, you know, consistency is such an important piece of that. Collaboration. Give the sense we're in this together. Um, we talked about empowerment. Um, you know, what are their goals? Are they realistic? Manage expectations while doing as much empowering as you can. And cultural humility is so important because we know about disproportionality in the system with our clients. And understanding if you look different, feel different, maybe come from difference from your clients, that you, you, you cop to that and you consider how that impacts your work together. And by the way, even if you're from, you know, you're working with an immigrant client and you came from that same country, not making assumptions that you know what their experience is. So um, just, you know, including all of those things will help you build a trauma-informed relationship. One more set of tapas um, that I encourage you to bring in other trainings on. Some skills that help you do everything that we're saying here. Um, one is active listening. That's the handout we gave you. It's all about um, building trust and rapport. Very client-centered. Active listening, you can tell I'm a talker. I teach this. It's still something I'm trying to get better at. But it's basically not sitting there waiting in your mind while the other person's talking, thinking, as soon as they're done, I'm going to make my point. I'm going to ask my question. It is being fully present. I understand what you're telling me. I'm going to feed back to you. So what I think you're saying is X. I'm going to give you an opportunity to go, yep or no. That's it. Doesn't mean I agree with what you're saying. It's all about I hear you and I'm with you and I want to show you that, that I get it. Um, so the handout talks, I, it's so important. I gave you a lot of little tidbits in the handout on skills that allow you to listen actively. From making sure you don't ask, ask yes or no questions to paraphrasing and reflecting, um, validating like I did with my client. Um, Giving time for silence is crucial. I know time pressure is there, but it will make you better. And um, motivational interviewing, who's heard of that? Okay, that's another counseling technique that, you know, I recommend you all go to the full day workshop because it's amazing. And um, the gentlemen who are famous for this are Miller and Rolnick. And um, it, it's a, a lens that lets a, helps us let go of our desire to get people to do what we want them to do, because we're, we're fooling ourselves, right? We have this misconception, we can make people change, we can make people act. And um, it's all about people's motivations. A lot of times when there's a motivational interviewing slide, it shows scales, much like the legal scales, because when people don't act or change or do what you want them to do, it's usually about ambivalence. On the one hand, I really, really want to go to that substance abuse class so I can get my kids back. On the other hand, I'm in so much pain and I don't realize it, and if I stop using, I'm going to have to face all this stuff. Uh-uh. So it's getting at that ambivalence 
and it's just another way um, to listen really well and it's about really exploring with the client so you can use that kind of tool you can say to the client wow on the one hand you're telling me that you really want the kids back and you really really want to sign up for that anger management class on the other hand you're telling me you don't think you need it you want to talk about that that's motivational interviewing get at the ambivalence and boundary setting um, is so important just because we understand what's going on with our clients it doesn't mean we don't believe they're capable and so we want to not always be you know letting that one client who somehow gets us to return their calls more than another one we want to think about having clear expectations for our clients. So these are some concrete tidbits that I'm going to go through so we can get through the rest of the presentation. I mean, I'm going to pass over, but some concrete tips on how to manage different things. So now is you. I imagine that you all do this and know this, but just as a reminder, and obviously this isn't an ideal world. I've never seen a space that has so many cases. I don't know how you all do it. We were maxed out at 80 cases at the Bronx Defender, so that you all have 300 is, or 200 even, is kind of mind-blowing. So in an ideal world, if you are pressed for time, which I imagine you always are, um, there would be a way to not show it so that your client feels safe and your client feels like they have the space to be heard and that they can trust you. Um, and pay attention to how you start your first meeting. I think that's huge. You know, I just remember being able to tell my clients, listen, I live in a space where I'm not surveilled by the state. Every step I take, you know, if it's doing my laundry, throwing away my trash, or after my kids go to bed, whereas most of my clients kind of, they didn't have that privilege. And I think acknowledging that is oftentimes really important um, in terms of, you know, just where you're starting from. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it blows my mind that you all don't get to have conference rooms or interview rooms here, and you're kind of like talking to someone in their most vulnerable moment. I just, you know, we used to call like termination of parental rights, I'm sure you all do too, like the civil death penalty. So it's like someone is facing that, like that is a possibility at the end of their road, and we're just going to have this kind of casual conversation in a room full of, I don't know, hundreds of people about something that they have like just experienced. Um, it's tough, so kudos to you, but I think it's just important to kind of remember that because I think it very quickly becomes normal. Like, I don't practice in this courthouse, but I've been here enough times to, like, now I don't even think twice about it, but that's not normal, you know, to, like, have a three-minute conversation with someone just after their kid has been removed and after they've waited seven days to know where their kid is. Um, understand that due to the impacts of trauma, you may need to take breaks. You obviously probably don't have time to take breaks because you have another case that's being called. But, you know, if your client needs that, if there's space for that, I think it's so important to say, either let's table this, or let's come back to this, or I'll give you a call, again, if there's the opportunity to do that. Um, let the client know they can go at their own pace. Again, this is an ideal world, obviously, that's not a privilege in this courthouse, so I'm sorry. <laughs> and take note of the physical setting, um, as we just talked about. Um, it's a rough place over there across the street, um, and I think it's, a, it's not conducive. It can be very triggering to someone um, who is feeling very vulnerable, scared, anxious, shocked, whatever it is. Um, so I think it's just important to remember that. Um, at the end of your meeting, to be able to summarize accomplishments and debrief together, I think I've walked away with so many clients in, the, in this courthouse um, who are like, mm, what comes next, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think knowing kind of what you just experienced and knowing what you need to do kind of gives someone uh, a little more purpose and kind of makes it feel a little safer. And so being able to have that one minute to be like, hey, this is your next court date. This is what needs to be happen. This is what needs to be happening. This is what you can like plan on, not plan on. Your next visit should happen by this date. And if it doesn't happen, call me. But just, I think, kind of having like a concrete here are the five things that need to happen before we touch base next is really helpful. Um, and again, if there's homework, make sure the client understands clearly what needs to be done and by when. Because I think for a lot of our clients who have been system involved their entire life, like they've heard parenting anger management therapy for years. And I think oftentimes it all sounds the same. And so I think being really clear about what it is that you're asking your client to do or what's expected of them and like what the system is going to look like for them um, is also really important. Um, 
court orders and their implications? Is it three visits, three times a week? Is it two visits for nine hours? It, there's just a lot of confusion. Um, and then I think people don't feel empowered to then ask or demand, um, which you know they should be entitled to do because these are their kids. Um, and the state has taken them oftentimes unfairly. That's just my two cents. Um, preview the next meeting court date. So kind of knowing, again, what this process is going to look like. So if day one is just a detention hearing and you're talking about something with a standard that's basically an inch off the ground to, you know, the next court date where maybe there's some hope and like maybe kind of, you know, what the process is and what it looks like as far as when they can get their kids back, when visitation can increase, when kids might be placed with family members. But I think just kind of letting them know that even though the next court date might not be six months from now, that things can happen between now and then. And then, as always, leaving time for questions is so, very important. Speaking of leaving time, I'm going to take you to, oh. we talked about that, summary, and then I want a minute for self-care. Don't leave. That's the most important part of this. So you, you want to do this one? one? Okay. <laughs> so your role is <laughs> um, not to fix every problem in their lives, um, obviously. Um, be open to hearing their trauma story. I think like creating that space is so important for our clients to again feel empowered, your clients, to feel empowered in this space um, because I don't think anyone else is paying any attention to what their stories are before they got to this courthouse um, and it's also relevant to why they're in this courthouse um, and giving the client the space to share what and when, um, kind of when they're ready, providing choices and a sense of control. I think being able to to let a client, I mean, obviously every client's going to come in and say, I want my kid back, but kind of giving them the options as to like how to make that happen is really important um, when, for much of your life, you felt like you've had very little control over things. Um, seek help when you feel like you're in over your head, and take care of yourself, each of you, because this work is really hard, really, really hard, um, and I think sometimes people forget. So I know that this is a whole separate training because we do those, but it is probably as important as understanding the three E's. So that's why we bookend it. Um, for people who say self-care is this new age luxury, I want to read a quote from this guy named William Shakespeare. I don't think anybody would call him uh, new age. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. So you can call Will new age, then this is new age. But this is an age old thing. It's actually in the Social Work Code of Ethics. Mm -hmm. Self-care is an ethic. It's in um, school counselors. Um, I don't think it's in the ABA, but um, there are more and more articles. If you want to email me, we've been getting lots of articles on mindfulness and stuff for attorneys. And so I just want to say what it is. It is any activity we do deliberately in order to take care of our mental, emotional, physical health so we can be effective advocates. Otherwise, we're going to shut down. And there's a whole um, training on what that might look like, but I want to call attention to the silencing response because I think all of us who do this work are really susceptible to that, aside from the stuff we do to ourselves, like eat too little, eat too much, sleep too little, sleep too much, yell at our friends, etc. But silencing response a way to silence those who are manifesting trauma symptoms. I'm not talking about the expectations and boundaries things or redirecting inappropriate behavior. This involves shutting down our empathy, <coughs> demanding unconsciously and sort of non-verbally or somehow conveying the message, trauma survivor, I can't hear it. I don't want to hear it. And imagine how that impacts your case. So if you ever feel like your client would just get over it, um, kind of doubt your client or feel like, oh, well, they got themselves into this. You use sarcasm. Um, you're worried if the client opens up, it's just like going to be nothing you can do. Um, you see some of these clear signs we've talked about today and you're like, I can't, I can't go there. Guilty, I teach this, guilty, and I try and pay attention to that. And I go, got to up my self-care game. Self-care is not anything you have been forced to do. Self-care is not anything you don't enjoy doing. And like I said, it's not selfish and it's not a luxury. So think about maybe having a separate training on that, learning about compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma, learning about 
tips on how to do it, like literally put it in your calendar and um, think about as we say goodbye, one thing you can commit to do for yourself today because guess what, it will make you better attorneys, that some kind of deliberate choice that takes care of you that will help you personally and professionally. And just to summarize, um, this is an approach that helps clients heal and keeps you whole, strengthens your case, builds trust, and you're very clear and empowering with your clients. So that's a 10 hour training in one hour. We'll stick around for questions. Thank you for sitting here in your lunch hour.